Good morning again. I hope you all had some coffee. Um, I'm going to lead off the professional development uh, section of our um, AGM. And uh, I'm going to start with uh, talking about our um, responsibilities. And it was interesting to see, I just got my APEG BC Innovation Magazine, and they are having a committee on, uh, or no, there's going to be a talk on uh, evolving responsibilities of engineers. So it's always good to talk about um, our responsibilities and go through what we actually, who we are and what we're doing. Um, so my presentation, I'm going to go through uh, who are we, uh, what are our clients' expectations, what are the MOE's expectations, the Balancing Act, um, AP and standards responsibilities between the risk and the standards, uh, why we do this kind of work, and uh, there we go. So who are we? Uh, we are all senior or expert and or uh, scientists and engineers. We are contracted by the clients to do AP services, which are applying for and receiving MOE instruments and preparing AP letters, plus other things that we get asked to do as APs. We also um, review instrument submissions on behalf of the Ministry of Environment. So that's, that's kind of our role. We are reviewing for a submission. We're trusted by our clients, we're trusted by MOE to conduct a thorough review of the submissions following the protocol guidance and procedures from MOE. We review and provide other types of AP uh, approvals, such as letters, for example, scenario five releases. So why am I reiterating who we are? I think because there's a lot of different expectations on uh, the client side and the MOE side. And so we need to ground ourselves on what we actually do when we are doing an AP work, because AP work is different than our normal consulting work. So what are the client expectations? So they want timeliness in receiving their instrument. Uh, they are wanting it to be cost effective, of course. And uh, they also want the review to be very thorough and complete so there's no delays in receiving their instrument. They want their instrument on time with no delays. They also want the approved professional to understand what the MOE expects so that they, they want the AP to understand both the regulatory and the technical. I don't know how many meetings you've been pulled into because you're an AP and you know the regulatory uh, regime and you know the technical aspects. So that's part of our role. Um, they, the client expects the AP to involve, be involved in the different stages of a submission application. And they, do, they want that because they want it to be readily accepted by the MOE. They also expect that the wording on the instruments is communicated to them and is correct. And I know the wording on instruments is they've changed and they've evolved over time. And we, I don't know you guys, but we've had lots of conversations with our clients about the wording and uh, understanding what the wording is and knowing when there is uh, the ability to uh, edit the wording and when there is a, a no-go zone from the ministry that you cannot change that wording. So what are the MOE's expectations of an approved professional? They also expect a complete and thorough review of the submission. They want a complete and thorough review of all the non-CSAP submissions, for example, Scenario 5 releases. So you can't get a Scenario 5 release slipped under your, on your desk going, sign here, please. <laughs> you actually have to review all the information. And it's expected, if, you, if an AP signs it, the ministry expects it, that it has been reviewed by an AP. They also have an expectation that there is a CSAP level review and a CSAP level product for all the submissions that the AP submits to the MOE. For example, high risk sites, for example, letters that we give, anything that is signed by an AP, they expect a high level um, and thorough review for that product. And the MOE also expects the APs to understand uh, what the, the, the regulatory and the technical aspects. 
So there's a balancing act here. I don't know how many people have had to uh, found this difficult at times. And that it's a balancing act. I mean, anyone who's done this for a long time knows that our, meeting both those expectations can be quite the balancing act. I'd like to know who hasn't had a balancing act, actually. Um, we got money involved. You know, the client's paying you. The ministry's getting the product. There's timing involved. They, there's timing expectations on the client's part, and there's the timing that you get from CSAP and from the MOE uh, that, that work into our, our lives and what we have to do. Uh, you got timing commitments because of seasonal sampling expectations that have to be communicated, and there's timing requirements for the instrument. I need it in two weeks. Well, that's how long CSAP might have it. You know, you, you have to communicate these to the client. There's also... Um, the MOE time to sign the instruments, which has gotten longer and shorter over time. I think it's now on the long version. And, uh, and that, that does, you know, the, the clients want to know how long it's going to take, and the MOE has, has their uh, issues as well. There's also uh, the changing expectations from MOE. As, as issues evolved, expectations change, and it's sometimes hard to keep up with all the issues all the time. And, and the expectations. Um, there's changing interpretations or new interpretations of technical challenges that come out. As we do the work, we're learning stuff. Uh, and if you're doing it all the time, you're doing vapor all the time, 24-7 in your job, you know it like backwards and forwards. And you have other APs that might not deal with vapor all the time, and they're playing catch-up. They might not be at exactly the same spot where someone is who does it all the time. It's challenging. And then also there's some rigidity interpretations. Some, the professional judgment has not been accepted in the same way um, as time goes on. It, it ebbs and flows, and, and you might not expect some rigidity in, a, in an interpretation that in the past has not been so cut and dried. So it, it um, can be difficult. Another thing is you get a pre precedent, which you, it's perceived as a precedent on one of your sites. You know, oh, I can use this for site Y, because it worked with site X. And it might not apply to site Y, and, uh, and that, that can give you grief sometimes. So there's new technical areas where there's uh, varying experiences by both the MOE and the AP. Uh, oops. So there's... In because there's varying experience, you have uh, increased uncertainty of expectations when you're doing an application. Oh, can I do this? Can I can't do this? Do I have to ask them? Do I, can I just do it? Um, professional judgment and what is required by MOE. And then we have the MOE staffing issues. Uh, there's too much work for too few people. So if we have a timing issue, that we need to get resolved really quickly, the MOE might not have the staff or the time available for staff to turn around your pre-approval in uh, like a week if that's what you need, if that's all the time you have. That you might have to have more time. Actually, I titled this, It's Difficult, instead of the balancing act, but I thought the balancing act worked a little bit. Didn't want to discourage everybody. <laughs> So we also have instrument wording difficulties. And I think some of that has been resolved now that the new templates have come out. But there, some of the wording um, in the summary of site conditions don't really work for some clients. And we're not allowed to change those. And so it's hard, to, uh, it's hard sometimes. And also some of the wording in the vapor clauses, they have to be communicated and understood. And when they change, it's... I mean, now it's a lot better with a new template, but before they were changing as you were submitting, and it got difficult. Um, there's arm's length. What's arm's length? How rigid is arm's length? And, I, and Greg, luckily, thank you, we'll be discussing that later on. Uh, and we're all human, and guess what? We sometimes get it wrong. Who hasn't got it wrong once? Like, we all get something wrong. So I'm going to work. I'm going to go back to now the responsibilities. I sort of talked about who we were, 
what are the expectations, why it's the balancing act, and it's sometimes difficult, um, but what are our responsibilities in doing AP work? Um, and this is between risk and standards assessors, especially, doing a dual submission. You need communication between the approved professionals. You need the standards AP and the project manager. They have to communicate with the risk AP and the lead risk assessor, or that may be the project manager. And some of the things that need to be communicated have to be the summary and conclusions of the DSI and the confirmation of remediation. Which chemicals and what media need to be included in the risk assessment? And a communication of what is, was or is delineated already. Uh, were any pre-approvals obtained and what, and what were they for? And depending on the project and the relationship between the, risks, the standards and the risk assessor, if you're in the same firm or different firms or what your level of comfort is, you might want to have that in writing. You might want those point, points. I know Ross does it all the time and he gets letters uh, from people he's doing his AP review. So it's, it's sometimes really good to have it in writing. And part of that feeds back into uh, signing of the summary of site conditions. It's, you know, we had a discussion uh, in this last spring about uh, is a risk AP really responsible for delineation? Well, you're signing the summary site condition and one of the P6 things is it has to be delineated. So you need to have a discussion with the standards AP to confirm it has been, uh, it has been delineated. It doesn't mean that you have to review the delineation as a risk AP, but it means that you have the obligation to at least ask the question, has it been delineated? And that's part of your Protocol 6 responsibility. Another responsibility is you have to make sure the documentation is correct. Uh, you have to review the summary site condition prior to signing. And I don't know how many of you do this, but I don't fill out the summary site condition form and all the tick boxes. I don't do that. I get someone else to do that for me. But I have the obligation to review it and make sure it's correct, which means I still have to go through the details. And you also have to review the instrument to make sure all the clauses are correct and all the, the COCs are in the right category. Uh, you can't expect Anna to do that for you, like do the best you can and send it over to CSAP and Anna will catch all your mistakes. Uh, she can only do that once maybe for you, but I think the second time you send it in, I think she'll send it back to you. So um, make sure everything is correct when you send it in to CSAP. You also uh, are responsible for making sure under AG 11 that all the items are covered. And one thing that um, I'd recommend, it's not required, but that have a paragraph included in the cover letter to CSAT regarding AG 11 compliance. Right now there's no place in the summary of site conditions to say that you've uh, met all the AG 11 requirements. I don't know if you want to do a separate you could do a separate letter. I don't know how people are doing it, but one way is to just put it in a cover letter uh, that it has been complied with. You might have other ideas how to deal with that. It would be great to have them. Okay, uh, another responsibility. You have to make sure all Protocol 6 requirements have been met. Uh, that includes that the contamination is delineated, that the standards meet, the site meets standards or risk-based standards. I mean, that's the back bone of why you're doing the submission or uh, a determination, that you've got all the pre-approvals, they've been obtained, that the arm's length requirements have been met, and those P6 requirements are for both the standards and the risk assessor. They're not just, if you're doing a signing, two people signing it, you have to, you, you have a responsibility to make sure they're met. Um, one option that uh, is always out there for an AP is to write a submission review letter. There's a template on the CSAP website and uh, you can write it just to help your review and hold on to it and if there's a performance assessment you can uh, then submit it to CSAP. You don't have to submit it with your submission. It could be your own personal documentation of your review. So have I scared you now? Why would we ever do AP work for all those expectations, responsibilities, oh, well, 
really, is it worth it? So I want to say yes, it is worth it. Um, I find it's always very challenging and I'm always learning. Because there's always new things, I'm always learning and uh, uh, that's, that's a good thing. Uh, there is a very unique relationship with the ministry environment as an AP that you don't get as you're, if you are a regular uh, practitioner in, in site contamination work. Uh, they, they do respond very quickly to AP requests. I think we get on the top of the list, if I'm correct. If you're doing AP work, they are um, very willing to help us. And, uh, and also, uh, as a CSAP uh, member in the society, CSAP has a very good relationship with MOE. We get uh, information in a timely manner. We, get, uh, we have an ear if there's an issue that's coming up within the membership that we can bring forward to the MOE that we're, that we're experiencing. So being, uh, doing AP work, we do have uh, the benefit of having a unique relationship with the MOE. I also love it that our uh, CSAP is very multidisciplinary and it's very distinctive, and uh, I think you should all be very happy that you are part of it. There's not many organizations that are as multidisciplinary as CSAP. There's always uh, an expert in something that uh, is part of your work, but maybe you're not an expert, that you can build on the expertise from that person. Uh, also, we are recognized um, by other provinces and federal agencies. There are RFPs coming out from the province and from uh, federal agencies that actually ask for a CSAP AP to be part of the team. So it, that, that does help in, uh, in our work. And I just want to end uh, with our vision statement. It's not perfect. It's a vision. So it's where we want to go. It's where we're heading. It's, uh, it's sort of... We want to be the trusted resource for sound environmental stewardship. And that's where we're headed. That's another reason why I don't do AP work. Should I take questions? Sure. sure. We're, late. <laughs> We're late anyways. If you have any questions, that's great. Um, part of the reason of doing this is for the new APs to uh, have some basis of what they got themselves into. Anyways. <laughs> Thank you.